Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. Yeah, it was a row house. Good afternoon. I know some people are still getting food. Feel free to take your time doing so. I wanted to welcome you all to the Women in Public Policy Program. I'm Victoria Budson, the Executive Director here. As most of you know, our work focuses here at WAP on creating replicable interventions and closing gender gaps in the areas of economic opportunity, political participation, health, and education. We have our Thursday seminar series that in addition to the people in this room, we have a very lively podcast following of more than 11,000 members. We greatly appreciate the people both in the room and the people who are listening virtually at the time of their choosing. So when we ask questions, we always ask people to stay on topic and to make sure their question ends in a question. It is my enormous pleasure to welcome a colleague from Boston's academic community. Uh, Ariane Chernock is here with us today, and she's speaking on a really exciting topic, the right to rule and the rights of women in Victorian Britain. Her research in particular focuses on the contribution that men had made to the women's movement in the historical time period, looking at Great Britain, um, which I think is a great topic for us here. Her first book, Men and the Making of Modern British Feminism, from Stanford University Press, was published in 2010. And it called fresh attention to the forgotten but foundational contributions of men to the creation of, quote, rights of women in the late 18th century Britain. The book was award-winning, receiving the 2011 John Ben Snow Prize from the North American Conference on British Studies. Her work is highly supported and funded by major institutions, of which you will know the names, the Fulbright Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, Phi Beta Kappa, Huntington Library, the Humanities Foundation at Boston University, and the American Philosophical Society. Um, she received her MA from UMass Amherst and received no. her PhD. Oh, from, from it's okay. Spiritual. I did from my Bra graduate oh, sorry, work at Berkeley. Brown. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And her um, PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. So we're so pleased that she's with us here today. We look forward to her talk. And would you like questions during or held to the end? Held to the end. Um, sorry. That's okay. Unless there's something urgent, then I'm happy to speak about that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you for joining me today, and a special thank you to the organizers of the seminar for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, well, you'll note from my first slide that I have modified the title of my talk a little bit from the advertised or pre-circulated version, and I've decided for the sake of clarity and interest to give you a broad overview of the book I'm writing. I'm assuming that many in the audience are not historians. Um, so this will be a good kind of test case or litmus test for my book to see if it can speak across audiences. Uh, the book that I'm writing is called The Right to Rule and the Rights of Women in Victorian Britain. And um, before we get to that, I'm just going to delve into some of the thorny issues the book raises. Um, well, I'm going to give you an overview of the book before getting into some of the thorny issues the book raises about the gendered origins of constitutional monarchy. And in doing this, my hope is to bring as many of you as possible into the conversation during the Q&A. And the book and the arguments that I'm making today are very much in progress, not completed. It's a work in progress. And so it's a perfect time to get your feedback. I invite your questions, your comments, and criticism. And I can be reached afterwards at Chernock, my last name, at bu.edu if you would like to follow up uh, in person. OK. So at various moments during her long rule, Queen Victoria, who ruled from 1837 until 1901, so most of the 19th century, made clear that she was no fan of women's rights. In a letter written in 1852 to her uncle Leopold, King of the Belgians, the queen, then in the throes of motherhood, observed that her husband Albert, quote, grows daily fonder and fonder of politics and business, and is wonderfully fit for both, showing such perspicuity and such courage and I grow daily to dislike them both more and more. We women are not made for governing, and if we are good women, we must dislike these masculine occupations. It gets worse. In 1870, faced with the prospect of a women's franchise bill passing in Parliament 
The now widowed queen engaged in a lengthy correspondence with Prime Minister William Gladstone, in which he registered her, quote, strongest aversion for the so-called and most erroneous rights of woman. The movement of the present day to place women in the same position as to professions as men was mad and utterly demoralizing. And the queen feels so strongly upon this dangerous and unchristian and unnatural cry and movement of women's rights that she is most anxious that Mr. Gladstone and others should take some steps to check this alarming danger and to make whatever use they can of her name. <clears throat> Let woman be what God intended, a helpmate for a man, but with totally different duties and vocations. And again, it gets even worse. Later that same year, the queen condemned women's rights even more violently in her exchanges with the author, Sir Theodore Martin, who she had just commissioned to write the official biography of her deceased husband, Prince Albert. The queen, she fumed, this is perhaps her most famous statement actually on this subject. The queen is most anxious to enlist someone who can speak and write, checking this mad, wicked folly, sorry, checking this mad, wicked folly of women's rights with all the attendant horrors on which her poor, feeble sex seems bent. In forgetting every sense of womanly feeling and propriety, it is a subject which makes the queen so furious that she can't contain herself. God created man and woman different, and let each remain in their own position. Well, these are bracing words, indeed, especially from a female sovereign, right? But considered in isolation, they actually tell us very little about how Queen Victoria figured in 19th century conversations about women's rights. Victoria's opinions about female emancipation, after all, were initially registered in private, not public. While her opposition to women's rights would have been well known to her correspondents and a very small circle of friends and associates, it was not conveyed to a broader public until decades later. The Queen's 1852 letter to her uncle Leopold, for example, only came to public attention in 1876, when it was included in the second volume of Theodore Martin's The Life of His Royal Highness, the Prince Consort. Similarly, Victoria's now famous and far more damning exchange with Martin in 1870 about the mad, wicked folly of women's rights entered the public record in 1902, after the Queen's death, when the influential editor, Sidney Lee, included Victoria's letter in a footnote of his Queen Victoria. Perhaps most striking, Victoria's comments to William Gladstone on the vote from 1870 were only made public in 1933, when the barrister and historian Philip Godala published his The Queen and Mr. Gladstone. This was over 60 years after that initial exchange had taken place. So for most of the 19th century, Britons would have been largely unaware of the Queen's personal views on women's rights. And only in the early 20th century would they have encountered her direct opposition to female suffrage. This is an important point because it requires us to rethink many long and widely held assumptions about the Queen's limited utility to and interest for the 19th century women's movement. Now to date, just a little bit of scholarly background here, to date, very few scholars have been attuned to this gap or lag time between the private exchange and public circulation of Victoria's letters. As a result, the correspondence tends to dominate most discussions of the queen vis-a-vis -vis what her 19th century subjects would have called the woman question. True, a few scholars have insisted that the queen carried a certain subversive potential simply by dint of being a female monarch which no degree of personal disavowal on her part could ever entirely resolve. For the most part, though, guided by Victoria's own extremely caustic remarks, most scholars posit Victoria as a marginal figure in, if not active foil to, the struggle for women's equality. And her comments on the mad, wicked folly of women's rights really do get bandied about all the time in the literature on women in the 19th century and in documentaries on this century as well. In fact, I was just watching historian Amanda Vickery's 2015 Suffragettes Forever. Have any of you seen this documentary? It was originally on the BBC. I'd recommend it. But she does begin episode two by setting up Queen Victoria in opposition to the women's movement by citing her claims about the mad wicked folly of women's rights. 
Now, once we begin to treat Victoria's inflammatory comments as private musings rather than public pronouncements, our aperture actually considerably widens. Revisiting the 19th century women's movement with an open mind and careful and creative combing of the historical archives, we find that the queen, far from being absent from women's rights activists' intellectual, emotional, and organizational lives, in fact, played a central and surprisingly sustained role in the Victorian feminist imagination. This is not to suggest that Victoria, the person, offered much concrete encouragement on such matters. Historians and literary scholars have been absolutely right to stress the queen's own fealty to a relatively restrictive domestic ideology, even if on one occasion she did describe the marriage game for women as a dangerous lottery. And this is, in fact, kind of the closest she ever came to seeming to be sympathetic to um, feminist concerns or issues. Throughout her long rule, Victoria kept a careful distance from any activities that might be construed as too overtly pushing the gender envelope. She rather stood aloof from the woman's movement than opposed it, in the words of the suffragist and political correspondent Emily Crawford, writing in 1903. But this perceived aloofness did not stop women's rights activists from appropriating her image and doing whatever they could to leverage the fact that a woman was head of the British state. This was especially true during the first three decades of Victoria's rule, when the meanings of modern constitutional monarchy were still very much being negotiated. The Glorious Revolution of 1688 had invented this idea of constitutional monarchy, but what it meant in practice continued to be a subject of intense and often quite heated discussion for the ensuing two centuries. So in this particular political context, the tendency towards what I describe in my book as royalist feminism exerted a tremendous pull. After all, was it not extremely paradoxical that a woman was permitted to rule while her female subjects, up until the last quarter of the 19th century at least, were denied most of the rights and privileges accorded to men? Every wife except a queen regnant, the historian Linda Colley reminds us, was under the legal authority of her husband, and so was her movable property. This was until the passage of the Married Women's Property Act in 1870 and 1882. <clears throat> On the political front, the disjuncture was even more striking. Even at the close of Victoria's rule in 1901, British women still lacked the parliamentary franchise, a right that they wouldn't receive until 1918, even though men had secured these political rights through a series of reform acts over the course of the 19th century. And even in 1918, um, it was, uh, the law only applied to women over the age of 30, so it was still restrictive. Pioneering women's rights activists recognized this paradox, seized on it, and tried to exploit it. To demonstrate their loyalty to the queen, to celebrate and sometimes even inflate Victoria's political prerogatives, to call attention to the national tradition of including women in the royal line of succession, unlike in France and the German lands, where women were prevented um, from inheriting the throne according to the terms of the Salic law. All of these became prominent features of early women's rights campaigning, especially in regards to the question of the female franchise. So for reasons that were as much practical and opportunistic as uh, emotional and intellectual, activists considered the fact of the presence of a woman in the highest office of state, one of their best arguments for securing women's political equality. And this would help explain Victoria's frequent appearance in chartist and dissenting tracts, in parliamentary petitions and debates, in Langham Place periodicals, and in the statements and speeches issued by members of the numerous women's suffrage societies that um, were organized in the post-1867 period. And I want to take just a few minutes with you guys now to share some of the materials I found during the past two years living in London, sleuthing around various archives. And these materials, I think, point to the richness of this vein of Victorian feminist argumentation, and at least to me make it all the more puzzling that this um, this tradition or strand has been virtually ignored. So the documents I'm about to share, you should really treat as little snapshots. They provide a window into what is in fact a much broader and more wide-ranging 
conversation. So we're going to begin with William Johnson Fox and his A Political and Social Anomaly from 1832. <coughs> this was published in a progressive magazine called the Monthly Repository. And again, this is 1832, so five years before Victoria even becomes queen. I found this in the British Library, but copies of it are actually now available online. Fox was a Unitarian, a radical, and a committed egalitarian. And in this essay, Fox makes the figure of the female sovereign his means of broaching the still quite novel and controversial concept of women's political rights. And we have to remember 1832 is the year that saw the passage of a reform act, an important reform act in Britain, which extended the, uh, extended the vote to new classes of middle class men. And this had just become law, so it's very much on people's minds. Why, Fox wondered, were women granted access to the throne, but denied the right to an equal education, the right to hold property once married, or crucially, the right to vote. The condition of women, he wrote, was full of incongruities, but this was one of the most striking anomalies. Sovereignty, after all, was no trivial affair. Even a queen in parliament, he wrote, had considerable political authority. And then I have included a, a lengthy excerpt up here on the screen. You can follow along. She selects the persons who are to fill the great offices of state. The tremendous question of peace or war is in her breast. She is the empire to foreign powers, for it seems that courts know nothing of nations but their princes. She administers the laws by her deputies and judges. She is the head of the army, which is sworn to her service, and the head of the church, selecting the men who, as they prove good or bad spiritual guides, may lead souls to heaven or mislead them to perdition. All this and more not only may, but when the contingency occurs of a woman's being next in succession, must be consigned to her charge, or the Constitution is destroyed. So the queen, he's saying, has weighty responsibilities. Surely then, Fox urged, for the sake of consistency, if not decency and enlightenment, Britons really needed to incorporate women more fully into their polity. It made no sense to vest, as he put it, one woman with the entire power of the state and to extend to all others, not even its meanest fraction. So here we see Fox really pushing the queen's prerogatives and powers as a means of leading Britons to consider the highly controversial subject of women's rights. I think it's fairly easy to see why Fox would have found queenship attractive as a kind of point of entry or way into this conversation. First, the queen was a fact, not a fantasy. Britain had a long tradition of admitting women to the throne. You might think of Queen Elizabeth, Queen Anne especially. As Fox put it, not the wild theories of some modern speculator, but the wisdom of our ancestors and the perfection of our institutions had determined that men and women alike could inherit the throne. So this was an argument for women's rights that turned not on abstract appeals to reason or nature, but to the force of custom and tradition. And these are, for those of you familiar with British history, very appealing British logics. Second, we have to consider the immediate royal context in which Fox was writing. Again, this is five years before Queen Victoria's accession. And Fox would have been well aware that Princess Victoria, as he put it in this article, would soon succeed her uncle, King William IV. It was the uh, succession that made Fox's argument forceful, especially forceful. He really did sense an opening here realizing that Victoria could be a crucial weapon in subsequent women's rights campaigning, especially once she became queen. Now we're going to jump forward in time a few decades to 1866. This is a very important year in the history of women's suffrage in Britain. It was in June of this year that the Unitarian artist, activist, and intellectual provocateur Barbara Lee Smith Bodichon drafted her very famous petition on women's voting rights, which John Stuart Mill submitted to the House of Commons on her behalf. This petition was signed by 1,520 women and is widely credited with launching the modern women's suffrage movement. But few examine the language of the petition itself. And it's hard to find the petition, which is in part why maybe people don't read the document, but it does exist in pamphlet form at the London School of Economics in their women's library. And if you examine the language, you'll see that here too, the queen features prominently. 
In the petition, Vaudechon supplies two key reasons why the vote should be extended to all householders without distinction of sex. The first reason turned on questions of property. The fact that the male vote was tied to property, she explains, made it completely irrational to debar per, uh, certain property-owning women from being able to vote. But her second reason turned on the question of historical precedent. The fact that women could become queens regnant in Britain indicated that female suffrage was well in keeping with the nation's constitution. As she elaborates, quote, the participation of women in the government is consistent with the <coughs> principles of the British constitution inasmuch as women in these islands have always been held capable of sovereignty and women are eligible for various public offices. The petition thus assigned constitutionalism generally and female sovereignty specifically a fundamental role in the logic of female suffrage. And Bodichon would repeat these claims elsewhere and even pointing more towards the queen's responsibilities in this role. And in some of her other documents, she would also really credit William Johnson Fox with inspiring this line of thinking, which suggests a kind of intellectual genealogy here. So that's the 1866 petition. And one final little snapshot. We're going to jump forward again in time to 1897. This is the year of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, 60 years on the throne. And the document I'm sharing with you is uh, a, a public address that was drafted by Millicent Garrett Fawcett. That name will probably be familiar to some of you. Um, and it was addressed to Queen Victoria and given to Queen Victoria on the occasion of her jubilee. And you'll see at the bottom here, this is Victoria at the very bottom who is um, represented as Britannia. And I found this document in scroll form, I think it hadn't been opened in years, honestly, at the National Archives at Kew, and it's huge. It's a huge, huge document. Uh, so this was written on behalf of the Women's Suffrage Societies by Millicent Garrett Fawcett and presented to Victoria on this scroll that was designed by the artist Evelyn Lucas. And you can see that this address is trying to capitalize on the Jubilee celebrations by linking the Queen's 60 years on the throne to the suffrage campaign. So this address demonstrates that even 60 years into Victoria's rule, feminist activists were still determined to use the queen to secure female political emancipation, even if the payoffs of this kind of approach were no longer entirely clear. Actually, you know, after all, 60 years have passed and women still don't have the vote. They could vote uh, at the municipal level by this period, but they still didn't have the parliamentary vote. But as you might notice in looking carefully at this address, um, the language here is a little bit different than the earlier documents that I shared with you. Instead of touting Victoria's political responsibilities, her political authority in the manner of William Johnson <coughs> Fox or, or of Barbara Bodichon, here Fawcett praises the Queen's exalted example and describes her as the mother of the people and congratulates her on harmonizing the claims of the public wheel with the claims of home affections. Okay. So the queen that appears here is much less overtly political. She's personal, she's maternal, she's moral. It's all about the domestic. Why would Fawcett have dropped the references to the queen's responsibilities as head of state? I want you to table that question, but do keep it in mind because I'm going to return to it in just a few minutes. Why is this language shifting? OK, so as I've hopefully showed by delving into some of these concrete examples of royalist feminism during the 19th century, I think mapping this tradition is an interesting and important exercise in its own right. It shows us that Queen Victoria helped to inspire and served as crucial ammunition for several generations of women's rights activists. Documenting and interpreting their expansive engagement with the Queen is thus one of the central preoccupations of the book that I'm writing. <clears throat> but this exercise becomes only more significant when we take into account the effects that such royalist feminist <coughs> excuse me, impulses produced. Activist enthusiastic invocations of the queen did not go unnoticed by their opponents. Many conservative-minded moralists, journalists, politicians, and pundits saw royalist feminism as a real threat, an argument of a very popular character in the words of the anti-suffragist MP Henry James. 
and one he felt that actively needed to be countered. Beginning in the 1830s and really accelerating from the 1860s then, a range of traditionalists, at least on questions of sex and gender, strove to undercut royalist feminism in ways that were both implicit and explicit. By stressing the fact that queens had always ruled in a different way from men, <clears throat> by highlighting Victoria's own dependence on her male advisors, especially Prince Albert, her husband, and by drawing attention to the particularly circumscribed role of the female sovereign within a modern constitutional political framework. For an argument like William Johnson Fox's to work, after all, the queen had to have some degree of political authority. Fox's opponents recognized this, and they wanted to change it. So now I'm going to talk you through some of these concrete strategies that were in play during the 19th century to undercut the kinds of claims that were being put forward by William Johnson Fox and his followers. So we see this undercutting in the way that histories of Queen Elizabeth I, who was always kind of the role model of queenship in Britain, um, how those histories began to be rewritten <coughs> in the 19th century. Now prior to Victoria's rule, Elizabeth I was typically, not always, but typically portrayed as a queen of tremendous power, who had used that power to lead England with the heart and stomach of a king, to use Elizabeth's own words um, at Tilbury following the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1688. <coughs> now, however, eager to place Victoria within a stable political history that did not upset the gendered status quo, select writers and thinkers began to assign Elizabeth a less disruptive past. Instead of crediting the Tudor queen for the successes of her rule, they increasingly turned to the queen's counselors, male counselors, I should add, especially William Cecil, and the male writers, explorers, and inventors who had claimed their fame during the Elizabethan period. These men were now almost entirely responsible for the creation of that great Elizabethan era. Consider the words of a writer for the uh, monthly magazine in 1837, the year of Victoria's accession. Queen Elizabeth's greatness, he explained, stemmed from the achievements of others. Hers, as he put it, was a political glory reflected rather than self-emanating. Or consider the even more pointed assessments offered by the historians James Anthony Froude and Goldwyn Smith at mid-century. For Froude, a political conservative, Elizabeth owed almost everything to the patience of her statesmen, who, on the whole, were the wisest that ever served a European sovereign. It was their genius and daring, he wrote, which formed the splendid pedestal on which Elizabeth's own small figure was lifted with dignity. It's such a Victorian <laughs> formulation. <laughs> Goldwyn Smith, the journal, a, a journalist and Regis professor of modern history at Oxford during the 1850s and 60s, similarly strove to cut Elizabeth down to size. When Victorians remembered the greatness of Elizabeth, he explained, they really had before their mind's eye not the figure of the queen, but the figures of Burley and Walsingham, of Sir Philip Sidney and Sir Walter Raleigh, of Shakespeare and Spencer and Drake, and the heroic mariners of England returning from the attack on Cadiz or the victory over the Armada. And I could go on and on here, but for the sake of time, I'm going to cut this off here. You get the idea, right? OK, we see this undercutting, too, in the incessant attention to Victoria's own dependence on her husband, Albert, and other male advisors. Throughout Victoria's rule, pundits and political figures of various ranks and positions drew on an intensely chivalric language, one with an emphasis on female submission and male domination, to justify their own forays into politics and to portray themselves, rather than the queen, as at the apex of government. They represented Victoria, like Elizabeth before her, as a frail and passive woman, an illustrious maiden, or kind mistress, in desperate need of guidance as they kept putting it from masculine hands. Prince Albert was especially singled out for his role in propping up the queen, a function that both he and actually Victoria, to a large extent, seemed to have welcomed. This role comes into particular focus during parliamentary debates about Britain's entrance into the Crimean War of 1854-56. During these debates, Albert tried to use the throne to influence public policy. This was not the typical level of engagement that one would see from a royal consort, and it did provoke controversy. But Albert's defenders supported him passionately, 
insisting that the female sovereign required an ever vigilant and politically engaged husband. Note, for instance, Lord Derby's speech in the House of Lords, in which he explained that Albert really must intercede, given that the sovereign, as he put it, was female. Victoria, he explained, may not be in all respects familiar with public affairs. He's writing this 15 years into her rule. It was therefore necessary that she should have a person in her intimate confidence whose interests are bound up with her own, and that that person should be one able to consider the reasons given for the advice tendered to Her Majesty, and to suggest topics to Her Majesty which may or may not occur to her own mind. During the same parliamentary exchange in the House of Lords, Lord Campbell even went so far as to note that Britons had to approve Albert's involvement if they wished to continue, as he put it, allowing a female to mount the throne. The alternative, he explained, to Albert's interventions was, as he put it, to resort to the Salic law. And this kind of logic, again, was incredibly common. <coughs> Finally, we see this undercutting in a way that certain theorists and statesmen began to posit the female constitutional sovereign as distinct from and in many ways much more limited than her male constitutional counterpart. With the succession of Victoria, there was a marked increase in claims for a primarily procedural and ceremonial role for the modern monarch. We repeatedly see references to the fact that the sovereign now reigned instead of ruled. To be sure, gender was not the only factor here. Democratization, international pressures and conflicts, and all sorts of political exigencies, personalities, and forms of opportunism also played a role. I'm not the kind of gender historian who thinks gender explains everything, right? <coughs> Even so, gender is not to be discredited. How else to explain the fact that theorists so often treated the modern male sovereign and the modern <coughs> female sovereign as distinct entities, with the female sovereign assigned a far more limited or circumscribed role? A female sovereign, observed the liberal barrister Clement Tudway Swanston during the 1850s, reigned even more than a male sovereign. That is, her job was, quote, not to lead forth armies, not to interfere in civil contests, but rather to dispense the royal patronage to genius, to learning, to invention, to everything that redounds to the greatness of the empire at home or its high name abroad. For the leading jurist, Sir Henry Maine, the Salic law only needed to be applied in those countries where, quote, whether there be a constitution or not, a large measure of authority resides with the sovereign. Fortunately, he wrote, Britain was one of those nations where the sovereign did not have that authority. For these reasons, he put it, female successions have always been popular. And there's certainly a prescriptive element to many of these pronouncements. They're kind of willing this into reality as opposed to describing what has actually taken place. One journalist for the Saturday Review even went so far as to suggest in 1870 that the constitutional monarch always ought to be a woman since the tasks the sovereign now needed to perform were, as he put it, degrading in a man, <laughs> while in a woman they were natural and graceful. And this is why Prince Charles has such an unenviable task before him. <laughs> By the end of the 19th century, many equated constitutional monarchy with female sovereignty, and it was seen as a very feminine role with these feminine attributes. And I think we still work within that paradigm. So I've just sketched some of the strategies adopted by those Victorians eager to align the queen with a more traditionally gendered or binary worldview. These strategies, again, included rewriting the histories of past queens regnant, positioning Victoria in a dependent relationship to her own male advisors, and developing general theories regarding the limited role of the modern, and especially the modern female, constitutional sovereign. These were clever strategies, and they actually were quite effective too. Over time, it would prove increasingly difficult for women's rights activists to counter them, given that any rebuttal would, re would require a strong defense of the Crown's prerogatives something that as the 19th century wore on and we see democracy really taking root, that fewer and fewer activists were prepared to do. There are political misogynists, complained one writer for the Daily News in 1882, who maintain that all the credit usually given to female sovereigns belong to their male advisors. But what was this journalist to do? She found herself really at a kind of standstill. And this is why Millicent Garrett Fawcett's address to the Queen of 1897, which I showed you a few minutes earlier, 
seems to be more muted and more personal in the kind of claims it's making about <coughs> Victoria. By this point, certainly by the 1890s, the possibilities for royalist feminism were already in the process of closing down. Only complicating any efforts for feminists like Fawcett to issue rebuttals was the fact that these misogynist strategies were frequently and explicitly yoked to anti-women's rights agendas. Okay, so historians like Froude were also anti-suffragists. Okay, that link was often being drawn. From the 1830s, though gaining momentum from the 1860s, and continuing through the Edwardian period, anti-suffragists seized on these new interpretations of queenship and used them in a quite heated campaign to put royalist feminism to rest. And indeed, you can almost sense the kind of relief, it's palpable, that the crusading anti-suffragist Henry James experienced when he seized on these new interpretations of female monarchy. For they gave him, as he explained in the House of Commons during the 1870s, an answer to the question, which seemed at first sight to many to be, as he put it, unanswerable. That is the question of how, quote, inasmuch as the sovereign of this country was now a woman and her gracious majesty's reign was justly admitted to be one of the happiest on record, it was illogical to suppose that a woman was unfit to possess the franchise in a kingdom where a woman had proved herself to be so fit to rule. Now all James needed to do, or so he believed, was draw attention to the Queen's, as he put it, possession of negative political qualities, and to the fact that Her Majesty had been fully prepared for her high office by wise statesmen, with an emphasis on the men in that statement. Other anti-suffragists were quick to adopt similar tactics. The anti-suffragist Edward Bouverie, who was a liberal MP, reminded his constituents at a town hall meeting in 1873 that, quote, in this country the queen reigns but does not govern, and that in regards to the reigns of the three female sovereigns in Great Britain, they had been most remarkably successful because it had been in these reigns especially that men had more to do with the government than in any other reigns. The conservative MP Charles Newdigate offered a similar verdict. In a rousing speech delivered in the House of Commons to great applause in 1879, he insisted that it was ridiculous to argue for women's enfranchisement based on the fact that Britons have rejoiced in their female sovereigns. The sovereign of this constitutional state, he reminded the House, was practically in tutelage, for she could not act without the advice and consent of the Lord spiritual and temporal and commons in Parliament assembled. And again, I'm just giving you a taste for the kinds of arguments that were in circulation, especially from the 1860s. But again, you know, you, I think you get the idea here. Once Victoria's own most damning letters were released to the public, beginning in 1902, anti-suffragists, they had a field day, okay? And they only intensified their attacks. During the Edwardian period, anti-suffragists issued a series of letters, speeches, pamphlets, and flyers, in which they continued to highlight Victoria's own diminutive position vis-a-vis -vis the state, but now they also had the pleasure of including her own personal opposition to women's parliamentary representation. So it's a double blow. So I have here two flyers that I found for the past years. This, they were both issued by the National um, Anti-Suffrage Associations, 1907 to 1908. This is Queen Victoria and Government by Women. And you can see in bold, they're drawing on Victoria's own language, this mad wicked folly of women's rights. We women are not made for governing, right? But between those bold statements, they're also talking about the fact that as queen, she really didn't have, as far as they can say it, she didn't really have a political role, right? It's wrong to even think of the queen as a kind of political position. And here's another pamphlet, Queen Victoria, sorry, a flyer, Queen Victoria and Women's Rights. And again, it's using both Victoria's language and these theories that are crystallizing during the 19th century to really nullify or cancel royalist feminism. So it's in this context that royalist feminism, or what remained of it, that is the Edwardian period, that it essentially collapsed. The campaign to curb the queen's powers, at least on a theoretical, if not always practical level, combined with the disclosure of the queen's own opposition to the women's movement, and made Victoria a less than compelling feminist subject, as you can imagine. As a result, the Victoria that appeared in Edwardian feminism 
was much more likely to be represented as an intellectual dinosaur, a symbol of an undemocratic and unenlightened age, than as a harbinger of women's social and political transformation. She is completely transformed during the Edwardian period. So my book is about feminists' creative, dogged, and ultimately, I think we can say, unsuccessful attempts to appropriate the queen for their purposes. But it's also about how these appropriations prompted a dramatic cultural and political backlash, a backlash, more, moreover, that has lasting political consequences. For in insisting on Victoria's very limited political role, on her deference to male experts, on her symbolic and ornamental value, anti-suffragists and their associates served as unwitting architects of modern constitutional monarchy. They were not the only architects, nor were they always motivated exclusively by anti-egalitarian instincts. Nevertheless, in attempting to wall the queen off from suffragists and other sympathizers with the women's movement, they provided some of the most distilled, uncompromising, and impassioned statements regarding the monarch's removal from affairs of state. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really energizing and interesting talk. And we'll open it now to questions. And are you comfortable fielding your own questions? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what, if any, was the influence of labor on royal feminism? The influence of the Labor Party. Mm -hmm. So again, the Labor Party isn't really coming into, into its own until quite late in this conversation. Um, Kara Hardy actually does I think cite William Johnson Fox in one of his pamphlets. I don't know if he knows that he's, but he's citing that language. But by the 1890s, again, this is really compromised. Um, so it, they're not really playing a significant role. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much. So fascinating. I'm a political scientist, so I, I see so many contemporary parallels right, mm -hmm. to how female executives are framed. Yeah, yeah. But my question is, um, I have two questions. Um, do you see that this process of sort of the, the feminization and the kind of depoliticization in terms of the powers of the monarch role, does that have any influence too in the way that parliament over time can strengthen its powers, right, vis-a-vis -vis the monarch? And then yeah. do you see any analogies um, to other countries in Europe? Was Britain distinct in the way the female executive got symbolized and transformed, <laughs> or did this happen elsewhere? It's a great question. Well, I think. When I was saying there were other factors that go into this kind of feminizing process, this is the real challenge here. Some of this language that seems very misogynistic to us, sometimes misogyny itself was the goal, you know, the goal was to preserve separate spheres, but sometimes it's opportunism, right? Right. So it's a way for parliament to assert its power by seizing on this potential weakness and recognition that the public will say, oh yes, we do have a female sovereign, you know, that's right, you know, MPs do need to kind of help guide her and assert their own authority. And the exceptional nature of this is a really fascinating question and one that I want to think more about. And actually, I would really welcome other perspectives in the room. I mean, Victoria is the, um, the model female sovereign of the modern period. Most other female sovereigns are modeling themselves on her. Um, but this process is playing out differently, I think, yeah. in other places. Yeah. <coughs> So one of the things that really interests me about both Victoria and Queen Elizabeth is the length of their reigns, yes. right? So that, you know, when you're, you're talking about a change that Elizabeth happened, II. Elizabeth II, yeah. right. So that when you're, you're talking about the changes that happened, I mean, it's inevitable that over that period of time you're going to have a lot of social changes. That's right. That. So the question of, you know, what a very long reign actually brings, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, are there any potential kind of detriments just simply in that extension? Well, I think you raise an interesting point, which is that for most of the modern period, women have been on the throne, I mean, for the majority of the time, right? Um, so that contributes in a way to the feminization process itself. But also the continuity. And the continuity. The continuity Absolutely. You know. People have long known that constitutional monarchy really did come into its own during the 19th century. Um, so no one would deny that the monarchy looks different at the end of Victoria's rule than at the beginning. The question has always been why. And most often people talk about democratization, which makes a lot of sense. 
And I'm not trying to discredit that general shift away from the House of Lords and the monarchy towards the House of Commons. But there is a gender component to this, and a lot of it does turn on this, it, it is a very misogynistic language. I'm trying to tease out how that plays into this process and facilitates that transition. I'm not sure that answers your question about longevity. I think long reigns have proven to be the most successful, right? Because the sovereign becomes literally a symbol of that evolution, that tradition, a touchstone. We see that with Queen Elizabeth II today, right? I mean, I mean the fact that Churchill was her prime minister, right? People adore that. I, you know, I, I, I certainly think that, you know, Victoria's reign is looked on as being probably the most successful period. You know, in fact, Elizabeth I and Victoria, you know, when you look at Britain as a successful country, you know, those, those were those, like those glorious periods. They, they do get written about that way often. Mm -hmm. and, and when Victoria came to power, a lot of people, again, did try to harken back to that Elizabethan moment, but they tried to rewrite it in the process. When you have a female sovereign, that's a moment for great male creativity and, and exploration and adventure, right? Maybe not, that's not so pronounced with Elizabeth II, right? Because times have changed and we have other kinds of... I'm just thinking we live in an age of cultural appropriation, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm curious as to hear your thoughts on what, if any, effect this phenomenon that you describe has had on the rest of the Commonwealth and on the roles of governors general and on, and on the independence of those Commonwealth states. Which, now, which aspect of the process? The well, I mean, I think the, the kind of general feminizing mm -hmm. of the sovereign, of the sovereign right. role itself, and as well as, as you described, the kind of increasing influence of parliament over the sovereign and how that might have affected things in the other Commonwealth. Right, well, the, the willingness to maintain Elizabeth as the head of state for these Commonwealth nations, you know, I think that does turn quite a bit on her apolitical, perceived apolitical status, right? If she was perceived as a political agent, this would become much more complicated. And it's a lot of these qualities that I'm mapping that become associated with Victoria, especially by the end of her rule, right? Her ability to serve as a ceremonial tie, a moral presence, right? I think that has made Elizabeth more acceptable, more palatable in you know, these remnants of the empire, right? And often women became governor general, governors general, right before they were prime ministers in some of the Commonwealth countries. Yeah, I think is really yeah. Interesting. That, is, that is an interesting point, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? So if, go, uh, excuse me, the governors general are appointed by the crown. Right. And are, were point. often in the 20th century not natives of the country. Absolutely. They came from England. Absolutely. And I'm not sure that there are, it's hard for me to recall any governor general who then becomes a prime minister. No, 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 no. You're, you're absolutely right. Okay. It's a different appointment process, absolutely. So my question is a counterfactual, of course, if uh, Queen Victoria had been a man, can you speculate as to how constitutional democracy or constitutional yeah. monarchy would have evolved in, in England? So as I said before, I think that gender facilitates this process. I don't think it creates or invents it. So I think we still would have transitioned in this direction. But if you look at the kind of language around Albert, that's what I always use when people ask me these counterfactual mm -hmm. questions, I think there would have been more resistance and it would have taken longer perhaps to make that transition because there were a lot of people who really felt that if Albert had lived, he died in 1861, mm -hmm. the crown would have continued to exert more public pressure. Um, Queen Victoria behind the scenes was still far more interventionist than most people give her credit for. What I've been mapping is a language, mm -hmm. right? Victoria herself was never fully committed to it in practice. Um, so I think, I think it would have been a slower evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, so as a non, not a British historian, yeah. my question is, um, how would something like the Imperial of Africa or just wanting to extend into the colonies mm -hmm. and the non-Western world fit in? It's so interesting you say that. I, I didn't really talk about empire in this talk. So in addition to the strategies that Millicent Garrett Fawcett comes up with to try to continue to put forward, to try to link Victoria to the women's movement, you know, in addition to celebrating domesticity and morality, she also, to the extent that she talks about Victoria's political interventions, she always puts it within an imperial framework. 
And you see that by the 1880s and 90s, that those who are still holding on to this tradition point out her imperial accomplishments, because that is seen as less directly tied to kind of the domestic political arrangement. It's such a period of jingoism in the nation. And I think they felt that that was going to be the most acceptable way to talk about Victoria as a political player by framing it in these imperial contexts. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so she, you know, it's very much tied up to the expansion into Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, there may have been uh, conservative politicians who, and historians, who approved of Albert's role, but there was a good deal of opposition Absolutely. politically Absolutely. to Albert's interference as a foreigner who didn't know yes. English tradition. How do you fit that in? Oh no, absolutely. As I said, like people are um, people are um, pushing this notion of the crown. Well, as as Victoria and Albert themselves were doing, as being above party, right? But above party doesn't necessarily mean above politics. Albert wanted to preserve that political role mm -hmm. for the crown. Not everyone thought right. that was acceptable right. by any stretch of the imagination. So I am interested in the controversies that Albert's interventions. Um, that they kind of illuminate. I'm not, I don't want to ignore that. I'm curious about his defenders mm -hmm. because they are the ones who really do make these arguments that turn on a gender distinction between Albert and Victoria. And you would never see them justifying a female consort kind of playing the role, the public role that Albert played for her. And I think a lot of, I mean, initially there is not all that much intervention because after all, Victoria is only 18 years old when right. she comes to the front. She's very young. She's very inexperienced. Um, after that, there's a good deal of behind the scenes political intervention, especially about uh, cabinet positions, Absolutely. political appointments. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a veneer of limited activity, but uh, at the same time, there's a good deal of, of action interference yes. to the frustration of many of her political and this, this makes people, prime ministers yeah. and political leaders. This makes people really nervous. Gladstone especially yeah. tries to conceal the right. extent of her involvement because he doesn't want the word to get out. Right. And again, that's for different reasons, but those who are opposed to some of these claims that w women's activists are putting forward are especially nervous about that intervention. And that's why in a way they're kind of bending over backwards to say that you know the queen is passive, she's a nullity. They use all these expressions to try to create this language that's consistent with the separation of men and women in public life. And then, yeah. you know, paradoxically, there's also in the 1870s a Republican movement mm -hmm. in England. Absolutely. And it's partly because they feel Victoria is too withdrawn that's after right. the death of Prince Albert. That's right. And what's the point of having her if she doesn't do anything? So, you know, there's this tension between greater, and greater activity and, and withdrawal um, that Devil, the political dialogue. Yeah, and you see this. Conversation there the is some inconsistency. If you look at the times, right, sometimes they're saying the Queen's passive, other times they're saying she doesn't do enough. Why is she, you know, she's got to come down from Scotland. Um, so it's not always a consistent line of thinking. But those who were part of that Republican movement, in many ways, they were irritated that she wasn't even performing a kind of ceremonial role. Why wasn't she attending the openings mm -hmm. of certain events? It wasn't so much why isn't she weighing in on this no, bill, no, right. Um, right? It's more just that she still, everyone agreed that the queen needed to be in more public, visible. a visible symbol yeah. of the nation, right. right? So it is interesting. Any other questions? Yes? Um, so for British history, I guess most of the focus has been on Victoria portrayed as Britannia, sort of a unifying factor mm -hmm. of the British Empire. But I'm wondering, with all this emphasis on ceremony, how that play, might have played out in the colonies, so whether or not within emerging nationalist movements there's an assertion for, or push for independence because she's just a ceremonial figure and she doesn't really have reigning power, or how British colonial officials might have also used her to assert their own roles within the colonies and governing the colonies <coughs> and that tension between the yeah. empire and the metropole and sort of keeping everything tied together. Right, so that's another really interesting place where this gap between the theories about the monarch and practices again emerge. 
in a lot of the colonies, there's evidence that um, colonial subjects didn't always fully understand the Constitution. Not that British subjects did either, right? Um, but that they continued to think of the Queen as very much in charge. And that's one of those places, arenas actually, where colonial administrators seemed not as keen to correct that assumption because this idea of a female sovereign who has a more kind of maternal, maybe even humanitarian interest in them was beneficial. And so they're actually kind of using that miscommunication or lack of understanding to foster the imperial mission. But in a domestic context, people are much quicker to establish these kind of firm lines. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting. The imperial dimension of this is fascinating and one that I'd love to uh, explore even further. Yes? I mean, I came in a little later. I'm just wondering, um, have you thought about what you think might be some contemporary implications of this historical example for how we um, think about or you know, conceptualize or interpret uh, gender and leadership? <laughs> yes. It's yeah. a great question. And I, I, I really struggle with this. People often ask me to equate this history with kind of, you know, Thatch, you know, did Britain have Thatcher because of this tradition of female sovereignty? I. I, it's such a complicated legacy, and I hope that's what I've communicated today, that I don't think we can say there's this correlation between strong female rulers and more sort of, sort of public um, willingness to imagine Thatcher. There might be an element of that, but really, by the Edwardian period, the Victoria that people are left with is this one who's disavowing um, women's rights, who's disavowing a uh, political role for herself, who to the extent that she is one of the few female figures who's gotten a taste for politics, seem not to like it and to find it unnatural and unsuited to her sex. And, and that's the version of her and the whole 19th century that really gets mapped onto the 20th century. Um, you know, in terms of questions of sovereignty, I think the monarchy today is certainly, for lack of a better word, feminized or associated with these certain kinds of attributes, um, which maybe makes it not necessarily as closely connected to certain women's issues or women's movement that it might be. It also makes Prince Charles's task, as I said, I think that much harder. There's a lot of suspicion around him. If you follow British history, the whole debacle last in the last few years over the Black Spider memos, this idea that possibly Charles might be intervening behind the scenes is, is kind of greeted with horror um, by the British public. And in part, it's a legacy of some of these 19th century conversations. And I think only um, amplified by the fact that he is a man. Well, although Queen Elizabeth is gentler in, as far as one can tell, in yep. her treatment yep. of Charles than Victoria was in regard to her successor, yes. Edward the Seventh, uh, who she slapped down repeatedly Absolutely. for any kind of interference in politics yep. and was poorly trained as a result. Yeah, and certainly Elizabeth also meets resistance too when she, usually for inadvertent reasons, is seen as intervening. You know, she purred down the line to David Cameron after the Scottish referendum vote. And again, she was you know, savage in the press the next day. It's really Cameron's fault for even sharing that with the public. But you know, she's really seen as not being entitled to even have an opinion on these kinds of decisions. I don't know what she was supposed to say on the phone. you know, but, um, So there are these kind of strange legacies, um, question marks around the exact position of function of the monarch in, in, in British society. Yes. Yeah, but I was very interested in the, you know, the leaflet that had Britannia. Mm, because yeah. Britannia is such a, a, a powerful symbol mm -hmm. of the country as having a, a, you know, female gender identity, uh, which I, you know, I'm trying to think of any parallels, say, here. Oh. You know, we don't. Marianne in France. To, sorry. Yeah, Marianne in France. Do, and they're seen as these kind of abstract, right. you know, symbols of, of, of um, the nation. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, you know, but that, that to me, you know, and I think of all the years when I was in England and rule Britannia was such a, you mm -hmm. know, um, sort of strong thing. And, uh, you know, so, so maybe, maybe somehow having a sovereign, right, but having a, but at the same time, the other problem is when you, when you come to suffrage and all the things that go around it and over here too, it's about class and the people who, for whom, you know, life was fine, mm 
men and women, they, they often didn't want change. So, you know, I, I can see this in sort of political movements, uh, which, which may not break down by gender particularly. Mm -hmm. They don't always break down. There were a lot of women who were resistant to suffrage, right? Um, men and women come down on both sides of these issues, right. absolutely, for a range of reasons. So it's a yeah. distinction between the sort of symbolic um, yes. character of this yes. and then the actual on the ground people's emotional allegiances with, with one side or another. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we're talking about the contemporary situation, how does that relate to occasionally I hear the idea that Elizabeth is going to abdicate? She's and not going to. She's going to avoid abdicating until she can pass, she can skip her son. Now why is she trying to? No, no, she's not, she's not abdicating. Her? No. no, I don't think she has any plans to advocate. <laughs> and isn't there some attempt to bypass Charles? I mean, I'm that gets bandied about, and it's true, you know, that William is much more popular than oh, his okay. father. That's oh, the primary reason. That's where the energy is, <laughs> right? I see, so I guess it would be, to some extent, savvy. But I think once you start tampering with this system, oh, people okay. recognize mm -hmm. that it's a slippery slope. And I, so I don't think there's going to be any... But the next monarch is definitely going to be man. Yes. Oh, yes. So if you look at the, so this yeah. is the fascinating thing. Absolutely. Now we're looking at generations that are going to have male, male yeah. sovereigns. Yeah. 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 It's really going to shift. I'll be curious to see how the language around the throne changes. Even though there's been a constitutional change that women Correct. don't lose their place in the line of succession yes. if they're followed by yes. a younger brother. I have to say, secretly, I was really hoping George would be Georgina, you know, yeah, yeah. but uh, just because just it would have worked a lot better with my book. Um, <coughs> but that's okay. You know, I'm flexible. And, um, I think, <laughs> you know, I think this will open up some new questions. But yes, on paper now, you know, men and women have equal access. Yeah. Well, thank you. If there are no more questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. You can talk to me you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And again, email me if you have further thoughts, questions, and thanks for being such a great audience today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Can you go to please join us next week when Michelle DeGuid, who's an associate professor of organizational behavior at the Olin Business School at Washington University, is going to talk about the consequences of value threat, the influence of helping women on female solo preference for female candidates, meaning when you have one woman who's elevated to the C-suite, the idea that she's gonna help other women come up, um, and she'll discuss her findings on that, which as you might imagine, aren't quite that simple. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.